SPIKES acronym was developed by Walter Bale, who was a physician that worked at MD Anderson. I don't know a ton about this person. They may still work there, but you know, a little bit of background there. Well, hey there, it's Liz Rohr from Real World NP, and you are watching the Real World NP YouTube channel. We make weekly episodes to help save you time, frustration, and help you take the best care of your patients. In this episode, I wanna to talk to you about delivering bad news in primary care. So this can be really challenging for ex experienced nurse practitioners, brand new nurse practitioners, just pretty much all of the above. I have to say though, it does get easier and easier with time. Um, however, I've talked to a lot of new grads who struggle with knowing how to, how to approach it, where to go, how to have those conversations, whether you're breaking uh, a new diagnosis of diabetes, for example, or if you have some suspicions that there could be some sort of more um, like ominous process going on, like a cancer or something like that. So in this episode, I wanna talk through um, an established framework called SPIKES that you can use as one option. It's not the only option, but it's a really nice framework to talk about uh, these types of conversations, especially as you begin practicing them or as you continue to practice and get better. So this SPIKES acronym was developed by Walter Bale, who was a physician that worked at MD Anderson. I don't know a ton about this person. They may still work there, but you know, a little bit of background there. So what is the acronym SPIKES? So I'll, tell, I'll tell you the steps and then we'll talk about each of them and kind of what it looks like. So number one is setting up. Number two is perception. Number three is invitation. Number four is knowledge. Number five is E, emotions and empathy. And number six is strategy and or summary. And so let's, let's talk about what that looks like, right? So for example, let's take a new diagnosis of diabetes. This can be very upsetting for patients. It's not necessarily as um, upsetting as potentially like a life-threatening diagnosis, for example. However, it is still upsetting. So you can approach this diagnosis in the same way, right? So first of all is talking about setting up. Um, I have a little bit of an adaptation to add, but setting up in this framework refers to setting up the office environment such that you're ready for a conversation with full attention where somebody feels safe. And so I, I did some reading about creating safe spaces and because it's something that um, at this point is kind of an innate thing that I do. And to be continued, if that's something that you feel like you want more support with, please let me know and I can try to articulate that better of like how to practice that thing. A lot of us are really empathetic in, in primary care as clinicians and so most of us kind of get a sense of what feels safe and what is not feeling safe as a person ourselves and so we can kind of do the same things intuitively. Anyway, let me know. But basically what you wanna do is make sure when you have conversations that could be potentially sensitive is that you've been thoughtful about how, how you're gonna have this conversation. Is it something that you must communicate over the phone right away um, versus is it something that is more appropriate to bring somebody into the office for. Regardless, if you have to communicate it over the phone, always check with the person, uh, do you have a moment where we can where we can talk, right? Making sure that they are not distracted in the middle of childcare, they're picking up the phone because they don't want to miss you, like that kind of thing. So are you available for a conversation if you have to communicate it by phone? However, I do recommend most sensitive conversations as we can, either doing a telemedicine visit or an in-person visit. The more more sensitive the the topic I typically have patients come in person if if and when possible because we have support systems at the clinic to be able to support an emotional thing for them if they feel like it's really gonna be upsetting potentially for them so that's the first one is s is setting up the thing that I'll add which is kind of kicks in at the K later with knowledge I really tie it into the setting up phase. Like, let's just skip ahead to that a little bit. So setting up also means us as clinicians being prepared. So are we prepared to have a conversation about X diagnosis, right? Are we prepared to answer questions, for example, about diabetes? When somebody comes, when we tell somebody something, are we prepared for the potential questions they may ask us and potential resources going forward? It also ties in later with uh, strategy, but let's hold that thought. So that's setting up, making sure the environment is a safe space um, and the person is prepared and you are prepared as a clinician with the information that you need to communicate to that person. The next one is perception. And I think this is really impactful and can take an extra step that we don't always think about. But one of the pieces is asking where the person is coming from to begin with. That's how I conceptualize perception is like, 
it can be asked in many different ways, right? And this is a framework you can Google. I don't own this IP. This is not my intellectual property. I'm just kind of explaining how I use it. But it's kind of like, okay, tell me, tell me why you think you're here or tell me what you understand about this visit or tell me what you understand about X, Y, and Z, depending on how much you've communicated, right? Because for example, if you called somebody on the phone or you had your team member call them on the phone and ask them to make an appointment to review their lab results, right? Did they have a lot of questions at the time or are they asking all their questions now, right? So you kind of just meet them where that conversation went. Tell me, tell me what you understand about like why you're here today. Okay, I think I'm, you know, the, the medical assistant told me that I'm here to review my lab results. Awesome, right? And then you can kind of understand where they're coming from and where their knowledge base is. So that's the core piece of perception, right? Because you're just kind of setting a foundation of like where they're coming from so you can meet them where they're at. Because a lot of times, especially as a newer clinician, you may be tempted to just launch into, hey, so you have diabetes, right? Let's hold that thought for a second. So the next one is I invitation. And so I love this practice. I think that it is so impactful regardless of if you're giving um, a difficult diagnosis or not because it's really, really patient-centered. And what this means is, is it okay with you if I review your lab results with you today? And maybe that sounds like a silly question, especially if you've had somebody come in, you've set the scene, there's a safe space, it's quiet, we have full attention, we've um, asked them why they think they're here today, I'm here to review my lab results. And then I ask, is it okay if I review your lab results? Like that might feel really silly, I just want to acknowledge that. And also, like it doesn't have to be like super robotic, like you can kind of like get a sense of how it's going with the patient, but like, the point here is that we're asking permission and it might sound really silly and feel really silly and really clunky at first, especially if you're newer to this, but it really makes a difference. I actually did this as an exercise when I was in my grad program where I was the patient and so, and there was a clinician as the pretend patient and um, my, my co-student was a, was the clinician practicing reviewing my DEXA results with me. And it was like, I was there for that quote unquote appointment, that fake appointment for that reason. But just something about being invited and asked permission, it really re emphasizes that it's really about them and they're in control. They're in control of their life, they're in control of their bodies, they're in control of their choices, right? And so it's a really subtle thing, may feel funny, but it is so impactful. Like I said, regardless of whether or not you review stuff, I always ask permission. Is it all right if I listen to your heart and lungs now? Is it all right if we, you know, review our lab results together, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Instead of just telling them the thing. Okay, so the next part is K, right? So we've gone through setting up, setting the scene, setting yourself up, perception, what does the patient understand? Invitation, we've asked permission to share something. The next piece is K, which is knowledge. And this is kind of like a tie into that, in, that next step between, is it okay if I share these results with you? The next piece, it's not necessarily in this framework, but is in other frameworks that I do include um, on kind of like the next piece going into knowledge. Because if you just launch into questions about what they understand about diabetes, it's kind of a spoiler alert, right? And so for invitation, it's like, is it okay if we talk about your lab results? The next piece is, um, I'm afraid I have some not great news or some bad news or some, some, uh, a new diagnosis for you, right? You can, I, I don't know. I don't feel, I'm still feeling this out myself. I don't necessarily want to label things as good or bad, but I feel like for patients who are not on the clinician side to receive a new diagnosis, that's not great. Um, it's okay to say it's, you know, I have some bad news for you. It's kind of this like foreshadowing piece that leads into the knowledge, right? And so I'm afraid I have some, afraid I have some bad news for you. And then you can let them know at that point, your lab tests are showing that you have diabetes. And then you pause. I can't under, I can't underemphasize, overemphasize rather this enough. Like we so quickly want to launch into the talking and the sharing and the support and the next steps. But it's so important to remember, even if diabetes, for example, is not life threatening, somebody needs time to absorb that. So once you've asked their permission, you kind of do some foreshadowing, you let them know you have a new diagnosis and then you pause. And then you kind of see what's going on with the patient until you, and before you launch into the next step, which is knowledge, right? Cause then you talk about all of this stuff you want to talk about as a clinician. And so you can kind of gauge their reaction uh, and, and keeping in mind, again, this is a bit of a nuanced thing that requires practice, but like you can keep in mind the stages of grief, right? And that, I don't know if that sounds silly to you, but like 
I think that if we can keep those in mind, regardless of whatever whatever the thing is in healthcare, um, whether it's you perceive it to be like, oh, this is not a big deal, diabetes is fine, right? For that person, maybe their mother died of diabetes very tragically, had some very tragic complications, right? So. You pause, you see how they're doing, remembering that there are stages of grief, right? Some people go straight into tears, some people are deer in the headlights, some people are in denial, some people are angry, right? You just kind of keep all those things in mind. You pause, you let them you know, have their space to have their feelings. We're not there to control their feelings, we're there to hold space for it, right? Space, space for all of them. Um, and then at that point, you can kind of check in and see how they're feeling. And also like this is kind of a nuanced thing between the knowledge and the, and the E part, which is the emotions and the empathy part. But like, what do you understand? Tell me what your understanding is of diabetes, right? Not from like a, not from like a quizzing perspective of just, just tell, tell me, tell me what you know about diabetes and what your perception is of diabetes, what you, what, what your thoughts are about that, what your feelings are, right? And that's getting a little bit nuanced tying into the emotions. I really like it to be step by step, but it really is kind of like a, a full thing. You see my notes here. <laughs> I laugh, just hold those up. Um, but yeah, so what do you understand about diabetes? And then, and then you can talk about, you know, those pieces of answering their questions. Um, if they have questions and you get into more like the details about whatever they want to talk about. One thing I want to start, what I want to really emphasize here when we get to the actual knowledge piece is when we are in that place, like regardless of where they are in their like grief reactions, some people are like, oh, whatever, that's fine. I, I suspected that, I had a feeling, I've been worried about it for a while, I had pre-diabetes last year, right? If somebody's chilling, then you just launch into the knowledge conversation, have a conversation, asking questions, letting them lead, and then thinking about your three main points you wanna tell them, right? It's really, really hard, especially as a newer clinician, to just pick three. What are the top three things you wanna tell that person? There is so much to say about diabetes, but it's really hard for people to retain information in a visit. And so it, what are your three points? But then the other piece with that, like I said, if they're not chilling with that diabetes diagnosis, they may be in a trauma response. I have an episode about trauma-informed care. I definitely recommend you watching that if you are not savvy with trauma and trauma responses. But when people are in a trauma response, they might, you might not be able to tell. They might just be like, okay, mm -hmm. they may seem totally fine. And when we're in that trauma response, that fight or flight response, we're probably not gonna retain information anyway, which is further reason why we only pick like three main things that we wanna communicate when it comes to the knowledge piece. The other piece about that is when you're asking what they understand, you know what their baseline information is, right? Are they a nurse practitioner themselves? They have a vast knowledge about diabetes because they also work in primary care, right? Or you have somebody who has never heard of diabetes before, right? Those are all options that you might see. So once you get into that, and like I said, this is kind of tied together in real life practice, I tend to, I tend to jump a little bit into the empathy emotions at the same time, if not before, depending on how the person is doing. But definitely, definitely, you want to include at some point expressing empathy for a patient. I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry to tell you this. I can see you're really upset. You seems like you're okay right now. Can you tell me about your feelings? Like what you're feeling right now? This can be very overwhelming for patients. How are you feeling right now, right? Really like normalizing, validating, um, keeping a safe, open space for them to express their feelings and expressing your own empathy goes an enormously long way for patients. And then the next step is the S, strategy and summary. So um, this is, we always wanna wrap up with a plan, right? This is, regard, like, this is true regardless if we're talking about a difficult conversation where we have to give some bad news or regular visits, right? We wanna plan, what is our strategy? You know, after we've expressed emotions, uh, empathy with them, held space for their emotions, validated their feelings, given our kind of like, maximum three points of teaching, assess where their knowledge is, where are we going to go? Because this really, it, again, it all kind of ties together because it's like, you know what, I, it's hard to, um, it's really, really hard, but I want you to know we are here for you. I am here for you. The whole team is here for you. We have many people on the team here to support you, take care of you, help you through these next steps and come up with a plan that works for you in your life. Right, And we also add that summary piece of like, okay, so here, this is where we're at. You have a new diagnosis of diabetes. There's a couple of things that we're gonna wanna do. 
and this is not a sprint, this is a marathon, and we're gonna come up with some concrete steps. We have a whole team to take care of you. Here's what we're gonna do next. One, two, three. And then the other thing to keep in mind that's so important is to think about, can you give additional learning tools for that patient, right? Some people are auditory learners. Some people are visual learners. Some people are kinesthetic learners, right? And so even though we've held space for that conversation, it's a lot. And so what are the other supplemental things we can bring for a person do we have a written summary that they can bring home? Do we have a plan for a follow-up call check-in with your nurse, for example, to see how they're feeling, right? In terms of like the emotional place, just checking in with them. Do we have a community health worker? Do we have a diabetes educator, right? Like what is that? What are those next pieces? And like, how can you support that person in their next steps? So you might have a couple of reactions to that, right? Number one, you could be like, wow, I'm doing a really good job. I do all of that stuff just intuitively, in which case, Power to you, my friend. Thank you so much for taking such good care of your patients. If you are not there yet, there's no shame in that either, right? There's always opportunities for improvement and there's always opportunities to deepen our practice. And really, I, I was talking about this on my interview with Megan Kavanaugh um, last uh, couple weeks ago, last week, whenever that was. Um, and we were talking about how the first, the first couple years of practice months to you know that three-year mark is what i always say is that kind of like level of real competency confidence place you're really focused on safety right and then as you develop in your practice you get to do more and more things to give to give more deeper holistic patient-centered care and develop your skills right because this is a skill this is not something you hear once and then you're like okay i'm good right i've practiced this and i practice this and i've practiced this and it's also like normalize and validate that this is not it's not easy it can be scary it takes a lot of confidence and it can feel very clunky at first and so the most important thing is that we just we just try we let it be messy we let it be weird we let it be awkward and clunky right if we have tears Tears are okay. I've had tears with patients when I talk about a very hard conversation or a hard diagnosis. I think the one kind of pearl there is just keeping in mind, are we, are we, do we have tears because of our own stuff? Is it, is, a, is it a thing where we're kind of bringing our own stuff in there versus we're being there with that patient in those emotions with them? And it depends, right? Some patients are, it's appropriate to, to give them hugs. I, again, going into tra that trauma informed care episode, please, please, please watch that. It might not be on the top of your radar, but it is so important. I always ask permission, what do you need right now? Can I give you, would you, would you like, depending on the rapport with the patient, can, can I give you a hug? Can we call a family member? Or the family member is in the room, right? That might be a good idea for the setting up, please, if it's a really difficult diagnosis, right? Um, but yeah, so hopefully this episode was helpful. Um, I would love to keep talking about these types of um, I really consider this in the category of like leadership and confidence and really like through real world NP, I want to talk about the clinical topics. I want to talk about navigating health, the healthcare system, like all those different bits and pieces we got to learn on the job, right? Like procedures and billing and coding and how to order stuff. And I also want to talk about this huge role transition, which I really see as personal development and leadership. And really this is such a leadership type of topic. It takes a lot of courage, a lot of practice. And so I really applaud you for being willing to even listen to this episode and consider practicing. Um, your patients will absolutely benefit from it. So, um, so thank you so much. If there are other topics in this kind of leadership space you want more, more information about or anything like that, please let us know. If you haven't grabbed the ultimate resource guide for the new NP, head over to realworldnp.com slash guide. You'll get these episodes sent straight to your inbox every week with notes from me, patient stories, and other special bonuses I really don't share anywhere else. Thank you so much for watching. Hang in there. I'll see you soon.